Wow. Yes, we do have some memories, Stuart. If I shared all of them, we'd be here a long time. Both of us have memories. Yeah, we both have memories. Amazing. It's amazing how over time those memories can change to, you know, flatter the way you tell the story rather than someone else might tell the story. But thank you for your welcome. Just Lottie and I were just saying just now, it feels like coming home coming in here, coming with you all, um, I feel like amongst family and friends. I look around the room, we've got some great people in the space, and I'm just so pleased to be here to serve you in this way, uh, especially thanks to Jeannie and to Paul. Steak dinner last night was very nice, thank you very much. We did enjoy that um, wonderful experience. It's good to have Lottie here with me. We don't travel very often together. This is a treat, although I'm realizing the mistake I've made bringing Lottie with me is because this morning everyone welcomed me and then they looked over my shoulder and said, oh good, Lottie's here, and then ran past me to give her the more ex excitable welcome, including you, Kath Atkins, who screamed when she saw Lottie and just nodded at me politely. But wonderful to be with you, whether you're here in person or watching online, it's great. My name is Sim. Dandy has been said, I do love the local church. I've been leading the church, part of a church all my life. It's something I'm passionate about and I still think it's the hope of the world. And I know that when it works right, it doesn't always work right, but when it works right, it is God's plan A. It is God's plan A. I know you know that. I'm preaching to the converted. I get that. But oh, it's good to be here. Um, yes, um, we do have children. Well, we have a couple of fellas and a couple of girls. Um, one of my boys left home two weeks ago. He bought himself a flat and moved out, and we've never seen him so often. <laughs> it's amazing. Can I just tell you my parenting highlight? About a week ago, he said, Dad, I need to talk to you. He said, Dad, you were right. And I just smugly sat there going, oh, my God. He said, you were right. I should put things in the dishwasher, not near the dishwasher. He's realized that he now needs someone else to do that for him because he spent the first 22 years of his life having a dishwasher fairy, me, put things away for him. But there we go. So today I want to spend a few minutes. Um, I want to tell you a bit, if it's okay, a bit of a personal story. Um, we could talk about church and the book, Simply Church, but get yourself a copy. We'll do that another time. But today I want to tell you a bit about my personal story through COVID this last season, what God has been doing through me. And then I want to tell us or explore three leadership moments through key biblical characters where God um, met people at a moment of challenge. And how did those significant leaders respond in a moment of challenge? And how do you and I respond to the challenges we face? But I thought I would start by telling you my story which, to be honest with you, I'm uncomfortable. I'd rather talk about other people than yourself. That's why I've got Stuart to promote the book, because I would be terrible at it. I'd be like, yeah, it's all right. You please buy a copy, maybe. Um, I don't really like talking about myself, which is unusual for a speaker, but it goes like this. Um, every single summer for years now, every August, I change rhythm, and I deliberately do this, and I take the month of August off, and I get a stack of books that I've been wanting to read throughout the year but never got, got around to reading. And I get some time out, we spend time away as family, and I completely change my rhythm. I don't take any meetings, I don't see anybody, um, you know, I hope there's no pastoral emergencies, and I just kind of escape the local church for a month. And I take time out, and I do it for, for the key reason of restoring my soul, preparing myself for what's to come. And in our rhythm of church, September is the back to school. It's, it feels like, you know, we've done, you know, the, the one event has taken place and we're all off for a big awaken. Sorry, awaken is about to happen. You're all ready to go for a great new season. I come back full of energy, full of excitement, full of enthusiasm, what God's going to do in the next season. And every year, my, my staff team would go, right, what are we going to do, Sim? Until last summer. Last summer, I went away. I got a stack of books. And I sort of looked at them. And as I got through the month of August, I came into the start of the new season and I had nothing. I mean, I literally had nothing. And my team were there like excitable puppies. If you met my team, some of them really are like excitable puppies. Go, what are we going to do? And I went, I've got nothing. I have got nothing to offer you. I felt like I climbed up a mountain. And I was looking forward to getting the vista, the view from at the top of the mountain. And when I got to the top, I realized it wasn't the top of the mountain. There was another one hidden behind. And I did not have the energy, the resources to get up to another mountain. I was 
tired. I, was, I, I couldn't see where, what next was coming. As a leader, you want vision. You want to know. You want to see the future. I couldn't see a thing. And I felt depleted and I felt done. And I remember praying to God, and you might find this funny. I didn't find it that funny at the time. I was praying to God and I said, God, I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. I was even, and Lottie and I talked, I thought maybe this is it, I'm done. I'm, maybe I've done what I can do. I've, I've led church, I've, I've exhausted my natural ability and I I'm, I'm, need to find something else to do with myself. I, I'm, I just felt like I was empty. And I remember praying to God, I said, God, I just cannot find a way forward. I'm done, I'm finished. And I felt God say, good. That lovely little kind of gentle, but knowing, yeah, that's good. Like my son, who admitted how he realized I was right. I was having to admit my father, God, knew better than I did. Billy Graham said these words, when we come to the end of ourselves, we come to the beginning of God. I was at the end of myself. I'd relied upon my natural ability for years to get me through challenging times. And suddenly I was going, I can't. I have nothing more. I have no clever one-liners to offer the people looking at me for encouragement, vision, possibility. When Jesus saw his ministry in Matthew chapter 5, drawing a huge crowd, it says he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, there's a lot in that little half verse there. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. These were his opening words of the famous red letter Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. And yet, so how often do leaders think, well, if I'd had a bit more of me, God would be very grateful. I can make God's efforts go a bit further. If I just put a bit more of me in the mix, with less of you, there is more of God and his rule. I was in a leadership um, Zoom call earlier this week, and the person speaking said this. I've never heard this before. They said, in normal times, one in three leaders don't finish well. In normal times... One in three don't make it. What's it like in the times we live in right now? And I don't know about you, but I'm hearing stories of people, leaders, not just church leaders, people who lead businesses, people who lead schools, people who lead industry, who are just going, I cannot keep adapting. I cannot keep finding energy for the next thing. They are feeling overwhelmed. I've met church leaders who say, I'm walking away, not just from my, my ministry, I'm walking away from my faith. Leaders who told me they've not prayed in months, they've not opened their Bible, they are exhausted, they are struggling, and they don't know what to do next, but they know they can't carry on. It's a real story. It's not just me. I know there are others in the room right now who are feeling this. I was sent a link before Christmas to an article in the Church Times by a friend of mine. His brother, um, Paul Cowan, is the uh, chaplain to the Bishop of Oxford. And the Oxford Diocese is huge. They have some 800 plus churches and over 300 schools. And my friend's brother Paul was, the, um, was overseeing the emergency planning committee for the whole of Oxford Diocese. And they would regularly meet to plan how they were going to manage COVID in their schools and in their 800 plus churches. <laughs> you thought you had challenges. And uh, he, he wrote this article, which I found so helpful, where he likened uh, the stages of crisis that we have been going through to the stages of, of grief, to the stages of challenges that we face. And so he put together these four different stages, which I found really helpful. I'll share those with you with some lovely images I think we've got on the screen. There we go. The first stage, if you're like me, you'd love the first stage, the heroic stage. 
Everything was going online and we're going online and we're going to do a great job at it. Everything's going wrong. The pandemic is happening. You know, I remember March 23rd was our first, uh, first service online, Mothering Sunday 2020. We had no idea what we were doing. And I remember the moment where the camera stopped rolling. We cheered because we thought we'd been really successful at doing something we'd never done before. Little did we know it was going to be the same thing for week after week after. I thought it was a novelty, didn't you? For three or four weeks, we'll go online, we'll be viral, we'll be going to like on YouTube, it's going to be great. And then it carried on and on. And initially, I felt like this is fun, it's exciting. It's like we can get adapted, we can change, and we can go online and do different things, and we can make phone calls, and we can do online Zoom, and we can do connect groups in, in, in our homes, and it's great. We'd have to go out and do that sort of terrible small talk thing at the beginning. We just kind of turn the computer on, and we've had enough, we turn the computer off. It's great. Hero time. And it was exciting, energetic, and it was we were adapting, and we were learning, and we were sharing stories. And I was on WhatsApp groups, other leaders, and the adrenaline was kicking in, and it was amazing. And then came that sort of post-heroic moment where suddenly high levels of tiredness were kicking in. People were managing stress, people going off sick, people resigning from their jobs, not just in churches, but I'm sure you have people in your churches who are facing these things. The challenges of what we do, do we wear masks or not wear masks? Oh, how has that split the church? I mean, just one look at Twitter and you can go, the world is a mess, but the church can't agree on whether it wears masks or not, whether that's a fear statement or a faith statement. You know, do we do hybrid church, in person, online? We do both or the other. Do we opt for one? Do we close down the internet portal because we want to be together? Or are we reaching the world? We can't agree on these things. What about our egos when we see how many likes we get online or how many people viewed us on YouTube because now we can count how good we really are compared to the person who preached the week before. Oh yeah, that's telling, isn't it? Yeah, the room went quiet at that point. That moment where suddenly it affects your finance, it affects your volunteering in your church communities, there's that post-heroic moment where the reality starts to kick in and it's exhausting. But then he talked about the recovery stage of where we go through all the different emotions of, of anger, of being disillusioned with what you thought things would be, of even resentment, of even feeling depressed or guilt or shame and realising, like I said, that image of going up a mountain, climbing once again. And yet if you're in a car and you climb a mountain, you drop a gear and yet we're still trying to go the same speed we always went before and that post-recovery. But his final comment, I think the bit I'd like to leave you with before we look at some different stories in Scripture, is this piece around renewal. And I think Stuart alluded to this earlier. There is a season of renewal coming. The church is going to look different. It might look the same, but it's going to be different. And I'm hoping and I'm believing that you are all different. There's th th these, these stages of crisis are the, the stage that, that soldiers go through when they return from a war zone. They've been the hero. They've been on the front line. And then they're, now they're trying to return and find out what does normal look like for me when the adrenaline isn't flowing, when I'm just having to understand the trauma I've been through. What do I do with my life? We will never be the same again. But as we renew the church, as we find what God's got for us, I like it's that moment where the disciples sat on the beach with Jesus and had breakfast with their Lord and Saviour. Surely breakfast with a resurrected Saviour has got to be better than the Last Supper. I mean, imagine that moment. You're sitting with Jesus going, he's alive. And there's a renewal coming. And, and someone's going to have to grit our teeth to get through the tough stuff to get to the next season. Maybe today you echo my words of, I'm done. Maybe you're sitting here going, well, that's helpful, Sam. I'm not alone, but what do we do with that information? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, I'm wondering whether to walk away, whether this is the way I go for the exit. And if I'm honest today, I'm, I'm still tired. I don't want to tell you I fixed it all. I went on a little therapy course, and I went online and watched six videos, and now I'm all fixed. I'm like, this is a process that I'm going through, but I'm finding new ways to lean into God rely upon his strength, to keep whispering to myself when I get ahead of myself to say, it's his church, it's not mine. It's been here for 2,000 years and it will be a long time after me, his church will still rise up strong once again. I'm not coming to you on empty, 
I'm just coming to you a bit emptier in myself and more full of God. So we'll look at three characters today and, and hope this will make some sense. If um, you can turn to the scriptures, we'll put them on the screen, some stuff here from Numbers 20. We have the story of the famous leader Moses. Moses was probably the greatest leader of the Israelite people. And in this moment in num- Numbers 20, Moses is in Kadesh. And he has this moment in Numbers 20, his sister Miriam dies. And the people get frustrated and they run out of water. And there are thousands of people looking to Moses for his leadership. And in this moment in Numbers chapter 20, there is no water, says verse 2, for the people to drink at that place. They rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The people blamed Moses and said, if only we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers. Why have you brought the congregation of the Lord's people into this wilderness to die along with all our livestock? The people turned against their leaders. I don't know if you've experienced the Monday morning emails of people with opinions on how many people wore a mask on Sunday. You know, or what we should or should not have done, or what we should or should not have said, or what behaviour we did or did not do, whatever it might be. People turn on their leaders in time of crisis. In this moment of crisis, the people of Israel turned on Moses. And so Moses did what he always did. He turns away from the people, verse 6, and goes to the entrance of the tabernacle and falls face down on the ground. He worships God. And God says, gather the people, speak to the rock, and the water will come forth. But Moses was so annoyed with his people, so frustrated with his people, he got hold of the stuff and he thought, I've done this before in Exodus chapter 17. He didn't know it was Exodus 17, but that's what it was. He know what I know how this works, God, I hit the rock. And he relied upon his old experience. And instead of speaking to the rock, he whacks the rock twice. And in his frustration with the people, with their rebellious spirit, he reacts. And water gushes forth because God is a generous God. But he wasn't best pleased with Moses' behavior. And he said said to him, because of your behavior, you won't enter the promised land. And it became known as the waters of Meribah, which means arguing or bickering. There was bickering going on. And I want to say to us today as leaders, to guard your heart. People will say things about you. They will, if you don't know they are, they are saying things about you. If you're in a position of authority and leadership and responsibility, there will be people saying things about you. Guard your heart. Don't create a thicker skin. Guard your heart. And and guarding your heart is a process, a daily activity, a moment of reminding yourself who you belong to, who you are following, who are you giving your attention to. We have to keep on doing it. Small decisions we make change the direction of our travel. They say big doors swing on small hinges. The, The little reaction that we make to that person's request to you, the comment you make to somebody when you're in a bit of a rush to get somewhere, The reaction you have in a staff meeting because it's just not happening the way you think it should do or the speed you think it should do. Those little moments guard your heart. In Song of Songs 2, the phrase is, catch the little foxes before they eat up your vineyard. But while the fruit is still small, they will get hold and they will nibble and they will annoy. Oh, I know for me, this is, I'm I'm preaching to myself, I know it's the small things. It's the rolling of the eyes when the enthusiastic youth leader comes forward with yet another idea. Really? How do you guard your heart? It's a daily activity. Those little triggers can make a huge impact. If you want to know the state of your heart, check yourself next time someone disturbs you when you're in the middle of something. When your your kids run in and you're focusing on something that's really important, what rises up inside you? When someone catches you and you're trying to do something else and you're disturbed or disrupted, that's your true self spilling out. Watch your heart. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. When your heart is not guarded, when you stop loving your people, I think Moses stopped loving his people at that moment. That's why God was annoyed with him. Because God still loved the people. He still provided the water, but Moses was just annoyed by them. And let's be kind and loving to our people. 
You know, I know we've got, I mean, it's, I know why we went online. I know why we did it. But we turned church into an armchair sport. And I know because I'm an Arsenal fan. Armchair fans are not great fans. Because we can all shout at a TV screen, can't we, and tell them what they should be doing on the pitch. But church is meant to be a family that do things together. We participate. We're on the pitch. We don't want people spectating and watching. We want to be part of something. And I understand why we did it, but now we've ended up with this kind of, as I was reading an article by J. John, talking about the ecclesiastical polygamy, where people are just jumping between churches online and they're not committed to any one of them. And they're just kind of buying whatever they fancy from wherever they want it. Where's the sense of commitment and community and belonging? Because if we have this, this kind of watching mentality, it creates frustration because you can't change the game if you're not part of it. As a, as a fan watching a football match, you can't make them score the goal. You can will them, you can want them, and when they miss, you can get annoyed and frustrated. The same when you're just watching church rather than being part of church. I remember there was a moment last November I, was, I went to get my booster and it's a longer story, but I, I, I have um, um, a long-running illness, and so I had to, my booster before most people. I walked in, and all the OAPs in Romsey, where I live, were in the queue, and I stood out a little bit. And every person who came to see me said, are you sure you're meant to be here for your booster? And I had to keep putting out the NHS letter saying, yeah, I get to come in early, sorry. And uh, typically of me, I was running late, running late for a meeting, and I thought I could just nip in, get the jab done, and nip out again. And this lovely volunteer met me at the door, so I'm really sorry, we've got a bit of a backlog. Um, you need to sit in this queue of people with like heaven's waiting room. And I had to sit there in this massive queue, about 30 people in front of me. And she said, when you've had the jab, you need to sit for 15 minutes to make sure nothing goes wrong. No one tells me to wait. I mean, really, I was just like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on the king's business, I've got a meeting to go to, and I could feel it riling up inside of me. And I had to tell myself, fortunately I had a mask on. This lady is volunteering. This lady is trying to be kind to you. This lady is trying to help you, protect you. And you're going to react. And you're going to say something you regret. I could just feel it bubbling up inside of me. That's what happens when we're not participating. We're watching when we're observing rather than getting involved. And Moses were getting frustrated. In times of crisis, leaders get isolated. People get frustrated. God gets ignored. And the devil has a field day. Leaders, we need to look after our hearts, look after our people and love them well. The second character I want to just pop through is the character of David, another great biblical leader. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, we haven't got time for the full story, but essentially it goes like this. David is not yet king. He is an outlaw. He's got 600 bandits working with him. They have elite, uh, they become uh, you know, aligned with David. They're following him. And they know one day he will be king, but he's not yet. Saul still is on the throne. And David goes to war. And when he comes back to his hometown of Ziklag, he comes back to his hometown. He realizes the place has been ransacked. They've been successful at war. They come back, all 600 warriors, and they have realized all their wives and children have been kidnapped and taken away. All their livestock has been stolen. All their property has been taken. And it says in 1 Samuel 30, um, verse uh, 2, verse 3, sorry, when David and his men saw the ruins and realized what happened to their families, it says they wept until they could weep no more. They wept until they could weep no more. They were exhausted. They've come back from battle. They get back to their home, waiting the big kind of welcome and well done, you heroes. Instead, everything is desolate and been taken. And in that moment, these 600 warriors turn on David. David was now in great danger because all of his men were bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him. But... What does it say in the Bible? David strengthened himself in the Lord. Everyone was against him. David had, had lost his family. He'd lost everything he had. And now the people that were on his team turned against him. And David could have reacted. He could have yelled. He could have got frustrated. He could have told them stories. He could have tried to avoid the truth. Instead, David strengthened himself in the Lord. 
And I think those six verses changed the future of David's career as well as the future of the people of Israel. Because David didn't react, didn't re- retaliate. He went into the presence of God. He called the ephod over, the priest over. He said, I need to say, God, what are you going to do now? What's the next step? And it's a great story if you take time to read it. He goes and he recaptures all of his people with a graciousness and a love for his men. 200 of the men say, we're too tired to carry on. He says, that's fine. You stay there. The other 400 will go and do the job for you. And when they get back, having been successful, the 400 return. And they say, we don't want to give the spoils of war to the 200 who sat and looked after the baggage. And David says, no, we're a team. We're a community. We work together, we hurt together, we lose together, we win together. David's attitude and the way he strengthened himself in the Lord was what made David such a different leader. David goes to God because he has nowhere else to go. When you feel like you're at the end of your rope and you've got nowhere else to go, you've always got the presence of God. And we know this because we preach it, but I'm shocked how often I forget it. And it becomes the last thing I think often Lottie will say, have have you prayed about this? I know, I know, I know. And you think, yeah, I haven't spent time with God on this. I need to spend time with him. Everything changed with the story of David because he simply seeks God in his darkest hour. I believe prayerful dependency is at the heart of a Christian leader in crisis. I've learned to be more prayerfully dependent on God than ever before. Why? Because I cannot do it without him. Maybe I've fooled myself before, but I definitely cannot do it without him. I need him. Have you ever felt got out by your team, like David did? Maybe not the threat of being stoned, but maybe being challenged by your team, or people reacting to you, or pushing back on your decisions. Maybe while you're experiencing your own loss, your grief, your sense of frustration, people kind of complaining at you and you want to react. Or do you push into God like David did? The third and final character I want to look at is the character of Paul, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is uh, towards the end of Acts, Acts 27. And there's this moment where he's on a boat being taken to Rome. You will know the story. He's been arrested and he appeals to go see Caesar. And they say, okay, we'll send you to Rome, which probably with a bit of a hindsight, a bit of a mistake. But he ends up in the middle of somewhere in the Adriatic Sea and it's a storm is brewing. And Paul had already said to them, you know what, you're making a mistake pushing on. We should just harbour here, take our time. But they said, no, we're going to push on. And they did. And then... um, Verse 21 in Acts 27 says this. No one had eaten for a long time and finally Paul calls the crew together and says, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place. <laughs> I love that. It's like, yeah, we're in the middle of, a, middle of a boat in a storm, but you should listen to me. But, he said, um, you would have avoided all this damage loss. But, he says, take, take courage. None of you will lose your lives even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. He said, don't be afraid, Paul. You will surely stand trial before Caesar. That's encouraging. Uh, What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe, God, that it will be just as he said. The ship's going down, but not a soul will be lost. Paul was a man of courage in the middle of a storm surrounded by sailors and soldiers. He was, he was being detained. He was a prisoner. And yet he stood up. And he could have reacted. He could have moaned at God. could have moaned at the people for the decisions they made. But he was a leader with courage. He said, you need to know that the ship's going down, but not a soul will be lost. Over this last season, I don't think I would have behaved like Paul. I keep trying to save the boat rather than realise God wants to save people. Our job as church leaders is not to rescue the ship. It's the souls that God cares about. And, and Paul saw the bigger picture. It's just a boat. You may be really emotionally attached to the church you're part of. I get that. But God is not interested in the brand, the website, even the history of your church. He's interested in the people 
that are part of your church and those who are not yet part of his kingdom. He's interested in the souls. And sometimes as church leaders, we get, we get shipwrecked by chasing after the wrong things. We chase after the things that aren't important to us. We get disappointed by our lack of achievement, our poor habits, our mindset, rather than the external challenge we're facing. We get so busy trying to fix the ship that we forget to take courage and listen to God's leading. Where is he taking us to? Leaders, we need to be courageous. The courage to admit we are wrong that we don't actually know all the answers, that we are dependent upon God. Courage to tell ourselves the truth, to be real with ourselves. Sometimes we lie to ourselves what we can and can't do. We don't always need more faith. Sometimes we need to be more like Paul and have more courage. 2 Corinthians 5 says, we are always, this is Paul writing again, we are always of good courage. I love the fact that Paul was a man of courage. He spoke courage. I believe speaking courage and being encouraging, putting courage into people, is a habit that you form. I also believe that fear is a habit you form as well. Be careful with your words. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful how you speak, because with your words, you can build people up or you can rip people down. Even the words you speak to yourself, and people might laugh at me, but I will often speak to myself in a mirror when I've got a tough conversation to have. And I'm telling myself the truth of what God is saying, because I need to hear. So when I share, I'm coming out of a place of courage and encouragement. And sometimes everything in me wants to be more like Moses than Paul. I want to react, I want to rebel, I want to kind of moan. And I have to know, speak well. These are people that God loves. They are annoying you, but God loves them. They are souls to be saved. There is not a ship that we need to rescue. Why do you want to rescue a ship for? It's God's church, not ours. But Paul, in his courage, he knew the storm was real. I love the fact he wasn't ignoring the fact the storm was real. He knew it was real. Look, look, this is real. This is going to happen. But I know God's plan more is more real than the, the, the actual physical activity we're facing right now. Let's not ignore the reality that we're in. But let's recognize that our God is bigger than what we're trying to do. Stop rushing around trying to save the ship. We're looking to save the souls God has given to us. So as I wrap this up, then I ask the question for all of us today. How is your heart? How is your heart today? How are you? Are you more like the Moses, annoyed, frustrated by your people? Are you more like David, who feels like you're being attacked on all sides? We don't know what to do, said Jehoshaphat, but our eyes are on you. Are you wouldn't be like David, who strengthens himself in the Lord? Are you feeling like a leader of courage, hopeful of what is to come, knowing that God's plans are bigger? Don't live like a pauper surrounded by riches. You know, we have the very access to the heavenly realms. And so often we limit ourselves to eating off a diet that we create. We need to be pushing into the time, our time with God. I'm convinced more than ever on the importance of what we used to call a quiet time. That as leaders to spend time with God every single day, to create habits and rhythms and routines. They're saying, God, I'm going to give you the start of my day. I'm going to give you the end of my day. I'm going to give you my day through reading of the word, through time in prayer. Why? Because that's where our strength comes from. Some of us in the last season, we've been worshipping certainty. And now realising we don't have a monopoly on certainty. But we do have access to God, to lean into him. We live in a confused world, a world that is desperately needing someone to point them in the right direction. We live in a world that's fighting over climate change, economy, finances, anxiety, depression, mental health. They need hope of the local church. And the local church needs hope from its leaders. And its leaders are only ever going to be as good as the person they're leaning into. And if we're relying upon our personal experiences, our learning, our training, then it's always going to be a reservoir that runs out. But if we lean into our Heavenly Father, that's going to give strength to us, to give strength to our local church, to give strength to the community we're there to serve. We may not end up in the history books. That's not what we're called to do. 
But our Father God will say to us, well done, good and successful, celebrated. No, good and faithful servant. That's what he'll say. I've realized this year <laughs> that I have been leading church, involved in ministry since 1992. July 92, I went and took on my first role as a children's evangelist for an organization called Children Worldwide and did a year out 30 years ago. And in that time, I've had all kinds of incredible experiences, opportunities. I've had the pleasure of speaking at large events and yet yeah, writing books and traveling nations and speaking in front of great communities like this one today. Uh, but all that stuff that I thought was important, I want to repeat the words of Paul from Philippians 3, he said this, I once thought these things were valuable. Oh, if only I could, <laughs> if only I could speak on a big platform and have my name in light. So if only I could be on TV, radio, whatever it is. And Paul, who after listing all of his CV, which is quite impressive, he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. If I can leave you with one thing today, I say, please don't aspire for anything other than knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord. I think we can only sell what we're already buying. You know, somebody once said, we're not only a travel agent to somewhere you've never been. I think that was Brennan Manning or someone who said that. We want to be people that know our God. So when we preach our God, we are authentic through and through. And if anything in this last season for me, I am more committed than ever before to my faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, I am done, but I know that he is not. I still believe the church is the hope of the world. It's the bride of Christ. And I want it to make it as beautiful as possible for Christ's return. I still believe, even now post, you know, Christendom, confused, secular world that wants everything tidy, everyone to agree with everything as long as they agree with what I say that they should agree with. I still believe in a God who created the heaven and the earth, and that's okay. I believe he did it. I believe that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live on this earth, to die in our place, and I believe that story to be completely true. He overcame death itself. He sent his Holy Spirit to move amongst us, to be our comforter, to be the one who gives us the gifts to speak in tongues, to prophesy, to, to have words of knowledge, to see in miraculous and healing. I'm still believing in those things today. I still believe people of prayer. I'm still committed to that daily discipleship of reading the Bible of Sabbath and rest and routine. I'm still believing in the importance of family and community, that we are better together than we are apart. I still believe all that stuff. I'm still committed to the thing called local church. I still believe it's God's plan. But I'm not happy just to do it as a job or do it as a career. I'm not happy just to care for the poor because it looks good to our church's repertoire. But because I want to live the way of Jesus. I want to be sacrificial, thinking the best of others, wanting the best for them. Because I'm called to live the way that Jesus lived. I'm still committed to helping church leaders live the way of Jesus. I want to find everything I do to help serve others. I may be tired, but I'm not out. I may be done, but God is not. That's my story. I hope that's your story. Can we stand and pray together? And let's ask God to do what only he can do and bring life I know we've already led in some ministry, and I don't want to prolong things, but I just want to say, if today you feel like you are done, maybe take a time, close your eyes, and just to, you have a time of prayer between you and God right now. Maybe you are tired, burnt out on religion. Maybe you feel like you are at the end of your rope. Maybe you've got nothing left. Maybe you feel like you've got to the top of a mountain, and there's so much more to do. I know that in our weakness, God is our strength. 
to encourage you to reach out to God right now. He is your source. However, experience, as many experiences in this room, I get that. You've done this for a long time. Let's start again with Christ at the center. So, Father God, I declare in this place to those watching online, to the churches we represent, we want to be a people that put you first, that declare that you are the reason why we do what we do. Because you first loved us, because you took our place, because God, you're incredible. You broke through because you want to be in relationship with each one of us. You've made a way. And so we declare, Lord, once again, as leaders of your people, would we first be followers of the King of Kings? Lord, would the empire we build be the kingdom of God? Lord, would every, every effort we make be one to further your purposes? Lord, take each one of us here. Use us, I pray, to change the atmosphere as we were singing earlier. We would change the atmosphere of our towns, our villages, our cities, our communities, our congregations, our schools, our workplaces, our colleges. Not because we're doing clever things or saying clever things, but because we are living and breathing what it is to be a person that follows you every day of our lives. Lord, is in our humility... Would you get the glory, we pray, Father God? Would you be the name that gets lifted high, that would draw men to you, we pray? In your power and in your name, we pray all these things. I pray a blessing upon those listening. They would know they are filled once again with your spirit, that their strength comes from above. Amen. Amen.